that if you simply put an R next to your name, that means we can never say anything bad about you. And we always have to support you. And if you are the incumbent with an R next to your name, we can never say anything bad about you. And we always have to support you. Obviously, that rubs the grassroots groups the wrong way because grassroots people who pay a lot of attention, uh, they're not bought off by taglines. They ask an important question. Where's the fruits from the tree? We elected you in. What are you going to do? What are you going to show us? And... Welcome, everybody, to the Andrew Cooperwriter Show. Of course, I'm your host, Andrew Cooperwriter, and I'm coming at you today with three new stories that you may have missed. First, uh, last, oh, about two weeks ago, now, well, a week and a half ago or so, we had Representative Proctor on to talk about con laws, uh, an issue that affects northern Kentucky a fair amount, but also affects the rest of the state. Well, there's been some development since then, and obviously some of the hospitals are hopping mad uh, that Proctor and other representatives have gone after these con laws so harshly. We'll talk about that. Uh, Bashir versus Cameron polls. We've had two polls come out since the last time we talked about polls, one in June and one in July. We'll talk about what those polls have said, what it means for the Cameron and Bashir campaign, and I'll give you some of my takeaways from that. Finally, a Muslim woman in Lexington is claiming her religious rights were violated because she was asked to remove her hijab during booking. I'll bring you that story and my take on it. I think some of you might be surprised with how I feel about this story, but we'll have that and so much more here today on the Andrew Cooper Ryder show. So starting off, the Northern Kentucky situation regarding uh, certificate of need or con laws continues. So for those of you who are unaware, con laws is a requirement here in Kentucky that every hospital before they build locations, add beds, buy new equipment, add services, so on and so forth, have to seek permission to do so from the state. And the way that state confirms that permission is by asking the providers in the area whether or not that is a needed service. They can do some other studies to kind of dig into it, but that's their number one indicator. And if the providers in that area say, nope, we can provide that service just fine, there is not great demand for that, then they will not offer it. Well, this strange government enforced monopoly has created a lot of interesting situations all over the state. None more obvious than in northern Kentucky, an area that is significantly large and populous, yet only has one hospital system in the Kentucky area. Instead, they're losing 20 to 30 uh, percent, according to Representative Proctor, who got that information from actually St. East, the hospital that's having that stranglehold monopoly in northern Kentucky. They admit they're losing 20 to 30 percent of healthcare customers across the river to Ohio because they lack the choices and options to get affordable and high quality health care. So that has led many to call out for the repeal or at least uh, reform of certificate of need or con laws because it's obviously causing a much higher health care cost. You don't need to have your PhD like friend of the show Dr. John Guerin has in economics in order to understand that when government says you can't have choices that affects the pricing and it obviously causes higher health care premiums as a whole. Well, of course, uh, St. East Hospital can't handle this. Link North NKY, the newspaper, uh, one of the newspaper uh, website publications up there published an article talking about how a state task force has been put together to look at certificate of need. In that same article, they also put a poll. Now, earlier this week, if you missed it, I had a call to action for you. See, this podcast isn't just about keeping you informed, but it's also about giving you action steps. And I'm sure if you've listened to the Proctor podcast, as well as this one, where I've talked about con laws numerous of times and just did, and you're repulsed by them, the same as any freedom-loving Kentuckian should be, then you would want to demand they be repealed. And actually, uh, a few days ago, I provided via email, I posted on my Facebook and my Twitter. So if you're not following me on Facebook, Twitter, or 
getting my emails, make sure you one, check your junk for your emails or spam, but also make sure you're following me on Facebook and Twitter and signed up to get alerts. That being stated, they sent out this article and in that article, they included the email for Deanne Wink at LRC. And I will put her email in the description here of this show. And what you need to know is you, she is the um, LRC employee assigned to this committee and she is collecting up public comment on certificate of need. So if you want to shoot over an email that tells her, Hey, you, you need to repeal this. It's causing higher healthcare premiums. If you can talk about a time you've had to go out of state because of our certificate of need laws or because you couldn't find the healthcare you needed, include that. But even if you just look around and say, look, our insurance premiums, our healthcare, it is not up to the standard where it needs to be. And this is a big step to get it there. But of course, the St. East, they don't want that. So in this article for NKY, they also, as I said, had a poll. And St. East sent out this email to their employees. It says, timeline topics for July 19th. Action requested con poll. Link NKY, Northern Kentucky's news organization that has been closely following their certificate of need issue, is conducting an informal poll to see where residents stand. We encourage you to let your voice be heard. Keep in mind, they're sending this to their employees uh, where they have their direct line. And they go on to say, the article recaps yesterday's con task force meeting, con task force meeting, sorry, in Frankfurt, where state legislators heard from the Kentucky Hospital Association and other stakeholders impacted by con. They testified that con assures only the highest quality most experienced healthcare providers are delivering care in our communities, but that con also allows safety net hospitals like St. East, uh, St. Elizabeth, to serve all patients, regardless of their ability to pay. Maintaining con is critical to ensuring safe, quality, and accessible health care for all Kentuckians. If you'd like more information or want to join us in educating our community members, we welcome you to visit and share kyforqualitycare.org or like Kentuckians for Quality Care on Facebook. Thank you for voicing your support for keeping con. Now, obviously, anytime you're supporting something called con, maybe you should rethink your decisions. But putting that to the side and the obvious hilarity of the entire issue. How can Sanis make this claim about their ability to serve people regardless of whether or not they can pay? Do you have areas like Lexington? and um, areas like Louisville that do have multiple hospital systems. I mean, the Lexington metro area, I believe, is kind of smaller. And then the northern Kentucky area all combined that St. Elizabeth covers. But yet we have several, several hospital systems, all of which are able to provide care regardless of your ability to pay, and all of which provide the same uh, quality of health care as St. East. What this really damages and affects is their ability to continue to have a stranglehold on the healthcare system of Northern Kentucky. And they're not the only ones, though, who care about this. The Kentucky Hospital Association has a vested interest in ensuring that this government enforced monopoly continues because it allows them to charge whatever they want. See, same East, and this was covered once again in the podcast with Representative Proctor, see, same East having that lockdown of control gives them the ability to charge uh, a fair amount. And they know that. They admit that competition would force them to drive down their prices. And they're now trying and attempting to convince Kentuckians that them not having competition, which would drive up prices, is a good thing. Now, what happened to this NKY poll? Well, when the citizens were weighing in, not the people whose pockets are lined by these laws, we would see time and time again that they were greatly ahead, the pro-reforming con laws or repealing it. But the people for repealing it were greatly ahead. But after this email went out, within a few hours, the uh, St. East staff, the people who make their profits, off of this, the higher up doctors, I'm sure, because obviously the uh, employees at the lower level, either A, they've been brainwashed and believing that this is a good thing for them, um, or B, they haven't researched it or don't think about how simply markets work. Because obviously, if you are a nurse 
or a CNA or some sort of other frontline worker at the hospitals, you would certainly be in favor of repealing con laws. Why? Well, because without there being competition in the area, there's no competition for employees. That drives down your wages. One of the most interesting things that have happened with this inflationary period that Joe Biden has led us through is that we've seen gigantic increases in pay. Nowadays, even in most rural parts of Kentucky, nobody pays minimum wage or next to nobody does. It's really hard to find employees. They're paying more like 12 to $15 an hour. And we see that all over the country. That is having the same effect. Competition for workers drives up wages. So obviously having more choices of where to work would drive up your wages naturally. But that would once again hurt the pocketbook. See, that is the investment of the pack of lies that St. East administrators and the higher ups that make their money off of this stranglehold have a vested interest in. And once again, it's not just hospitals like St. East. It's hospitals all over this state that line their pockets because you have a lack of choices and their employees don't have choices of where to be employed. Coming up after this, the Bashir versus Cameron polling. We've seen some more polls there. We're going to talk about that here in just a bit. All right, Bashir versus Cameron. Polls have come out in June and another poll in July. And while it it, it speaks to something, it, it definitely doesn't, um, it shouldn't, necessarily deflate your hopes of Cameron being elected at all, but it certainly isn't necessarily what you'd like to see if you're the Cameron camp at this point. Now, granted, Cameron has just now really started hitting running ads. Well, not, I don't believe Cameron himself has ran too many ads, but uh, the, the greater packs and um, interested individuals in getting Cameron elected have started running some ads to hit Bashir, but mainly what I've seen personally, and maybe your experience is different. I've seen a whole lot of pro Bashir ads and attacking Daniel Cameron ads. And I haven't seen a whole lot out of the Cameron campaign. Maybe you've noticed something different, but even as I'm driving around, I see more yard signs and other things for the Bashir campaign. Now this is not necessarily alarming. Um, Cameron, when he ran his campaign before wasn't super big on handing out yard signs. And I believe, and I could be mistaken and somebody from the Cameron campaign can reach out and I would correct this, but I've been told that the Cameron campaign is also charging for yard signs, um, including even with the local GOPs, uh, they have to buy the yard signs from the Cameron campaign. Now that isn't necessarily, a. uh, a big issue per se. The local GOPs are supposed to be supporting their candidates through monetary donations. Purchasing signs from the campaign is an easy way to do that, while at the same time ensuring that if you're going to give out a sign, it's going to somebody who will put it in their yard in a good location. Uh, having been involved in many campaigns, I can tell you signs don't win them. And I can also tell you signs, signs can help. It makes people see that you have support out there, obviously. Um, but signs aren't the end all be all. There's a saying in politics, signs don't vote. And so if you don't see him putting a lot of push on signs, that's a good part of the reason why. But in these polls, we had one in July um, that polled 46% Republicans, 44% uh, Democrats, and 10% Independents, which is the general makeup of Kentucky. And it found that Bashir had 52% of the vote. And Cameron, 42% and 6% were unsure. Then in July, another poll came out that had um, Bashir at 49% of the vote, 45% of the vote for Cameron, and then 5% undecided. So obviously, uh, you'd like to see Cameron beating him in the polls. Cameron himself has a relief hook polls the show him within 2% hitting distance though. What I can tell you is he's got plenty of time to chop away at him, but I think Cameron has to start thinking about with these polls in mind. As I said, if you don't think it's going to be a squeaker, you don't have to worry about this, but if you do think it's going to be a close one, I think Cameron needs to worry about shoring up his base. And I'm telling you this is somebody who obviously belongs to the parts of Facebook and Twitter sphere, as well as communicate with individuals that fall into different categories. See, when you look at the Republican voter, you have generally what I look at as three or four categories. You have the party people, and, and there's crossover in these categories as well. You have the party people, 
you had the grassroots activists. They can be involved with their local GOPs. Uh, sometimes that's the outlet. Sometimes they have their own groups uh, that they've formulated. Things like the Tea Party, uh, things like uh, Make Americans Free Again. Uh, those types of groups that come together and meet. I know Warren County is the Warren County Conservatives. Um, and so those groups that fund kind of that grassroots level push, really the party, the, the people who donate a lot of money to candidates are part of the party apparatus. The individuals that actually go out there and knock on doors and do the volunteer work, they're more part of the activist apparatus, which falls into different groups. And a lot of times those come to a head. Uh, a lot of times in certain counties, especially, you see that the grassroots groups do not get along with their GOP groups at all. And a lot of this has to do with this idea that you see out of the GOPs, which is a greater argument maybe for the later day, but there is a belief at a lot of GOP parties, and obviously this helps keep control, that if you simply put an R next to your name, that means we can never say anything bad about you and we always have to support you. And if you are the incumbent with an R next to your name, we can never say anything bad about you and we always have to support you. Obviously, that rubs the grassroots groups the wrong way because grassroots people who pay a lot of attention, uh, they're not bought off by taglines. They ask an important question, where's the fruits from the tree we elected you in. What are you going to do? What are you going to show us? And I bring this up because the Cameron campaign has to worry about that group, that activist group, that group that provides the door knockers, that group that provides those kinds of push. As of right now, I haven't seen uh, necessarily a lot of engagement in those grassroots groups. We saw that during from the Cameron campaign, had some engagement of talking to them uh, during the primary uh, side of things. But now during the general, that communication uh, hasn't been reopened up again yet. But things change. Like I said, we're still a far ways out. You, you don't even necessarily maybe want to start knocking on doors right away with those people because uh, they're, the, the volunteers are short term. You want to use those bodies as you get closer to the race. Maybe that's a thought process. Uh, I know Bashir has people out knocking now. But of course, I think most of them are paid knockers. I'm sure Cameron uh, is putting together his knocking group if he doesn't already have knockers to go out and knock doors. But these grassroots apparatus people are, are you've got to worry about bringing them in. And it's really obvious that that is of some concern, that there's groups of Republicans out there who are either unsure about Cameron, uh, are not going to vote, or maybe they say, well, Bashir's the, the animal we know, um, or they are there's this weird thing that happens where individuals will hold their guy to a higher standard than the other guy. So we expect the other guy to behave in this way. Um, we don't expect our guy to behave in that way. So if our guy behaves in the same way, even the other guy does, we say, well, not we, I don't say it, but they say, well, I'm just going to vote for the other guy because I'm going to hold them to a different standard. We see that often too as well on the right side. This is just the bottom line. You can lament about it. You can be upset about it. You can yell at me about it, but that is just the facts on the ground when it comes to the electorate that makes up the Republican base. They're very split. And Cameron has to be thinking about how can he attract back in that base. And while, as I said, bringing Robbie Mills in is great to help out your Western Kentucky area. And he's definitely on the ideological, maybe Christian conservative side, uh, certainly brings people in, but on the Liberty side of things, uh, the Liberty Republicans, so you got Christian conservative Republicans, you got Liberty Republicans, and then you kind of have your establishment Republicans. And then they all kind of have interlaps as far as things like Trump Republicans, populist Republicans, things like that. But to your, to your Christian conservative Republicans, that certainly helps tie them down, though. I don't think Bashir, or Bashir, I don't think Cameron was necessarily too worried about the uh, Christian right, or he shouldn't have been, because obviously with Bashir shutting down churches and how he's regularly been on these transgender issues, that certainly can become a problem. I think where Cameron needs to be worried about as far as shoring up his base goes, he's got, and this is a hard form, he's got the Liberty Republican group, he's got to shore up. And then he also has the more moderate Republicans that say, well, you know, Bashir hasn't done all that bad in their opinion, and the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. This is even more obvious when you look at your down ticket polling. 
when you look at things like the in the same polls, uh, ag commissioner or attorney general, you're seeing gigantic double digit leads for the Republicans, like huge leads for the Republicans in those polls. Why? Because one, they don't necessarily view that as much of an important thing. And they're saying, look, R is better than a D. I don't know anything about any of them. So I'm just going to vote for the R because that's better than a D. That is simply what they're thinking when they're looking at that. When it comes to governor, people pay, quote unquote, more attention. The media pays more attention. I said, quote unquote, because are they actually paying attention? Are they doing their own research? No. I don't believe they are. I believe they're being fed whatever lines that the media or the campaigns give them and they run with it and then believe wrongly that they're informed instead of objectively looking at the issues. So what Cameron has to worry about is how do I pick up my moderates while also sure in the Liberty group? And actually he could deal with this in the same way, but he made, I think, a very critical mistake. And that was bringing on Mitch McConnell's chief of staff, as a key figure on his campaign. Um, bringing him on, I think, was a big mistake. I think that any, any association with the McConnell camp uh, in this way by Cameron, he can think it's not a big deal. But I think if he ends up losing, and I hope he doesn't, but if he ends up losing, the greatest mistake he made was after the primary, even having the appearance that he is somehow associated with Mitch McConnell. Simply for this, Liberty Republicans, a lot of other Republicans hate Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell is the least liked by polling data senator by his own state in the entire nation. And that's saying something. Trust me, that's saying something. He's the least liked. That means that even in the Republican Party, people don't like him. Liberty Republicans especially don't like him. Why? Because... He is the definition of a person who says one thing and does another. Mitch McConnell is somebody who says things like, we're going to protect the Second Amendment and then passes uh, some of the greatest Second Amendment gun control. He is the definition of a Republican that outside of spending money doesn't want to do anything else. He doesn't want to sure in government. He always says we need to be the adults in the room, which translates to, I want to do nothing other than forward whatever it is that's important to my donors. And what's important to his donors is that you, the taxpayer, continue to foot the bills for all the ridiculous crud that the government has decided to fund. And people are fed up with it. Republicans are fed up with the way he pushed things like the vaccines. They're fed up with the way he pushed uh, the gun control issues through. They're fed up with his inability to fight. They're fed up with a lot of things. And I think the greatest mistake Cameron campaign will have made was at all allowing himself to be greater associated with them. Because not only does that upset the Liberty people, but there are moderates as well that look at Mitch McConnell and don't like him. Once again, he polls badly. I get it. Maybe Cameron had to do it in order to bring in the money. Maybe it was a lack of talent. Cameron didn't know who else to bring in to fulfill those roles that he needs. Because as I said, when I brought up Terry Carmack coming on board, the McConnell chief of staff, well, it's hard to find a person who can fulfill all the things you need. There is a desert of talent in Kentucky for political, on the conservative side, for political operatives. That being stated, I really hope he looked everywhere else because I think um, the continued uh, attachment and disregarding of both the moderates and the Liberty Republicans that don't like the business as usual, the this kind of, oh, we're going to say one thing and do another. What we're looking for is indications that you're going to say one thing and do it. I think that's something Cameron campaign needs to really think about exhibiting in order to make sure he sures in his base. Because if this race is close, as the polls are right now saying, it will be very close. This truly is a squeaker. Well, you're going to need every vote you can get, Cameron. And I really hope you consider that as you think of how to weave that very precarious position. And I understand it's hard. It's hard to have a balancing act between the two. It's hard to appeal to everybody and not upset anybody. But it's definitely something that you have to master. Otherwise, we're going to see four more years of this year. Coming up after this, um, woman in Lexington got pulled over, arrested, 
and uh, says she had her religious rights violated. We'll be covering that right after this. A Muslim woman in Lexington uh, says that her religious rights were violated by the Lexington detention, uh, the detention facility here in Lexington. So this uh, Muslim woman gets pulled over and then arrested for, um, as, as I understand from the article, reportedly she was pulled over by the UK police and she had an unpaid fine, traffic fine of some sort. Uh, it was past the uh, deadline to pay or she didn't show up to court. So there was a bench warrant issued for her clearly, um, but it was a minor traffic infraction. And she was then arrested for that by the UK police, who then took her to, because there was a warrant out for her arrest, that then took her down to the detention facility, to the jail, uh, to be held. There, she says her religious rights were violated because in order to take the um, booking photo, they required her to take off her hijab. Now, that was, initially, you would listen to that and say, look, Understanding your religious rights, but at the same time, we have to. Uh, obviously, the police have to do their jobs, and you know the 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 religious rights getting in the way of their ability to just take a photo. Um, you know that's a hard hard line to walk. But it wasn't simply that. And for those of you who want to immediately say that, well, what'd she expect, or she's got to take it off, or yada yada yada, um, she actually did offer to remove it, but she requested that it be removed, um, that only women be in the room and involved in the photography process as she did it. For whatever reason, they weren't able to respect that, whether it was due to staffing reasons or what have you. And instead, they forced her to remove it in front of the male officers and booking officers as well, as she was then uh, booked in to, and then allowed to put it back on as she was booked in to the jail. Now, as I said, it may surprise some of you, but I actually support the woman in this case and say her religious rights were uh, put upon. It wasn't, didn't appear, at least from the article. I could be proven wrong, but it didn't appear she's trying to be difficult. She's respecting a key aspect of her religion. And while I'm not Muslim and, um, you know, if you're an Orthodox Muslim that strictly follows the teaching of uh, the Quran, then... I have some questions about how you square the peg that you should uh, kill people like me, Christians, if I don't convert to your religion. Um, but putting that question to the side, and I'm sure that this individual doesn't think she should just kill me because I don't convert to her religion. Um, there's certainly a reformed version of the Muslim religion that doesn't believe that. Um, so, and, and, you know, that to the side. But one thing that I appreciate about the Muslim religion is this idea of modesty, especially uh, amongst men and women. I'm not going to sit here and say it's necessarily the fairest rules in the world for men or women to be treated differently. I'm not even claiming that at all. And I'm certainly not pushing forward the idea that every single woman should have to wear a burqa or hijab. What I'm saying is in her religion that modesty is important and only revealing yourself around other women or your husband um, is a sign of discipline and respect towards your God. And while we as Christians, if you're a Christian, don't necessarily look at, uh, we don't have those types of things that we do, but we do other things, uh, obeyance of certain commandments, beliefs that show our respect and following of God. And I think we actually need more of that in our modern society. I think one of the greatest downfalls of our modern society is we are not modest enough that, you know, we, we don't act like the sanctity of marriage is something that is incredibly important. Instead, we view it as something we toss to the side and something that can be exited out of as easily as you can rush down to the courthouse and sign a paper or something to be tossed to the side when you get a little bit bored. Instead, I believe we should be celebrating ideas, whether that's a religion you agree with or not on all things, we should be celebrating ideas that say, hey, there is something sacred 
between a man and a woman. There's something sacred in a marriage. And if that includes making sure that no other man um, sees your head or whatever the, uh, the sect of belief is about that covering, says no one other than your husband should see that, that should be something we say we celebrate, a celebration of the sanctity of a man and woman getting married in their relationship. As I said, once again, I'm not over here trying to push forward an idea that everybody should wear a hijab or burqa that's female. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying that celebrating obedience to a higher power that involves uh, good ideas, good thoughts, like a thankfully filled marriage and um, having some, some monarchum of modesty in this modern age, we should put forward. And I do say shame on the Fayette County Jail for forcing her to remove this for her booking photo. Obviously, once again, she her religion believes it for a good reason, as I stated. And while you don't have, uh, you have a freedom, not necessarily freedom from religion, but you have freedom of religion in America, which means that you are free to practice whatever religion you want. I don't think it's unreasonable to have a religious belief that says, look, I can only take this off if I'm around other women. And can all the men please excuse themselves so I could do that? Now, granted, if more information comes out, there is more offerings given to her as such as the story develops, I'll be more than willing to change my opinion on this as I get more information. But based upon what I see, shame on you, Lexington Jail. Shame on you. Get it better next time. Well, that's what we have time for here today on the Andrew Cooperwriter Show. Uh, feel free to, you can always reach out to the show, by the way. If like, for an example, my last story, uh, you have an opinion on, it, you want to voice it and you don't just want to say it in the comment section or wherever you're at, please email me at info at theandrewshow.com. That's info at theandrewshow.com. You can also message me on Facebook and, and all other places too as well. And once again, please like, comment, share, subscribe, leave a review if you're listening on podcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day.